Okay, Tom, thanks for being with me here. As, uh, as we were just chatting, it's been a, a long time. I think, uh, well, yeah, 10, 10 years, I think, when we first met. But um, it's been really uh, interesting following you um, well, on, on social media, I guess, is, is the main platform I've been following your, your progress, um, especially since you started uh, Biota, um, I think in 2012. Um, and yeah, I've, I've found it a really fascinating um, journey you must, you must be, well, still be on. Um, uh, you know, um, there's all these ec exciting developments in, in the aquarium trade, but also it's largely marine conservation based. Um, and in, in Palau, so I, I was really interested to hear about how that all got started and how, um, and how things are going at the moment with it. Thanks, Tom. It's, uh, I'm really glad you reached out. Actually, it's good to connect again. It's been a long time and, uh, you know, we kind of met under unusual circumstances, I guess. So it's, it's nice to kind of continue that and, and follow on. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that's a big question that you just asked. I could go on for hours about the, uh, <laughs> the, the efforts we went through to, to make Palau happen. But, um, yeah, I can say it's, it's, uh, it's been a big adventure. It's been a, a long, uh, you know, exciting time it's been challenging and and sort of it's nice to you know i've been doing this for my entire adult career i've been trying to to breed ornamental fish successfully as a business and and as as you can imagine it's there's so many challenges and sort of finally i feel like i, I climbed that mountain and, and managed to get the wheels turning and and i guess um a big part of what we do you know it, it is sustainability it is that whole uh uh, I guess that the the sensation for some of uh, or majority of people that buy from us is that they're not taking from the ocean, right? That's the the big thing. They can have a marine aquarium, but they're not taking from the ocean, and and that's a nice thing. But it's it's a lot more than that. It's it's you know this this is it's essentially a, a domestication process where whereby the fish that we're raising, you know, they're growing up in an aquarium, eating commercial feeds, so it's. I often compare it when I'm trying to explain it to, to visitors here at the facility. It's like trying to keep a pet wolf versus to keep a pet dog, you know, like they, they've been raised in the environment. They're happy that they don't stress from being chased around the tank with a net as much. They, they, you know, they really just do better. The survival's better. The feeding range is better. And the lack of the less disease is, is apparent. You know, we've had really good survival and um, yeah, it's it's working. So yeah, I guess uh, Dom, I've always been in the in the hobby. I, I since I was a child, basically, I was uh, collecting guppies in or you know actually Corydoras catfish when I was uh, maybe six or seven years old in South America. That's where I grew up, and I I was just always fascinated with what was in the water rather than you know anywhere else. And it used to drive my parents nuts, and and it, to the point where I was yeah catching anything I could in any puddle and just putting it in a tank and raising it to see what it was. So I was often targeting young stuff. I was really interested to see what they would grow into. Even when I, yeah, I think I was eight or nine, I raised a, a bullhead catfish that looked like a tadpole, things like that, just because I was so yeah. interested in what is it, you know, what is the animal? And um, yeah, it just stemmed from there. My, my grandfather got me into breeding uh, guppies and cichlids as a teen. And, and I ended up with a garage full and my house full, driving my, my poor mum insane. Um, and you know, bought my first car with with money from <laughs> from breeding fish. So I was I was just always going to do it. It was something that was just I was just I knew it was the you know I studied fish I guess a lot and and really admired the sort of uh, life strategy whereby they you know rather than like you know humans or, or bigger animals we might only have one or two we take a long time to grow up. The fish have just gone for that strategy of you know, billions of eggs. So the fecundity level is just so huge and the potential for that to be utilized, whether it's for food or for ornamentals or restocking reefs, which is something I'm really interested in right now. You just can't compare that to any other animal. That that reproductive strategy and the efficiency, the potential uh, return rate is so high. Um, and that's why I knew that would that in one way or another, I was going to get a business, you know, to, to work from that concept. It just It just took... A lot longer than I thought <laughs> to, to get off the ground. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's been a long road. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess when I was, uh, you know, studying, I, I got uh, 
some good offers. I, I got a scholarship I turned down and I just decided I wanted to do marine biology and not so much because I, I wanted to be a scientist, but more because I wanted to learn more about, you know, what I, what I wanted to breed. Um, and it was really apparent in, through my degree, I was doing all kinds of uh, fish breeding actually at James Cook. I had also my room there was full of tanks that I brought up from, you know, the Gold Coast <laughs> in a trailer and um was just avidly sort of back at it and uh yeah i i, I kind of knew i was always going to be hands-on rather than a scientist you know in a lab but i knew that i needed that groundwork i knew i needed that base baseline of, of the science side of it to, to to get the proper grip and to to sort of analyze data properly and things like that so uh it was great and i i finished my degree after doing i did like a double major i, I guess it was a you know many many courses more than I needed to um, out of necessity, but also out of interest. I kind of diverted a lot, but always found myself uh, getting a little frustrated, to be honest, with academia. Like I, I, I understand the process and I know why it needs to be there, but I knew it wasn't me. I, I, I got frustrated with the you know people chasing grants and that, that whole industry a little bit ugly. And, and then just the fact that as a master's or a PhD, I couldn't even choose my topic. And I found that like, outrageous you know like why why can't i decide exactly what my research is going to be and, you know you get given supervisors and they're sort of guiding you towards easier or things that suit their research a bit more and i i got kind of frustrated and, and um i managed to find an option to to start the first company which was in 2000 uh my first uh business which was called ocean oddities um and that was on the gold coast in australia uh, on the tweed heads actually and, and that's where uh, a friend and i set up my the first sort of commercial aqua farm and yeah we got to it breeding seahorses oh wow oh uh, that's yeah so that was <laughs> that was in 2000 yeah, <laughs> yeah good. cool i know i do know the fe i know the feeling about what you're talking about with academia i mean i just just finishing my phd and especially that um the you know the fight for funding sometimes that used to frustrate me a lot um yeah. I used, you know, I was very fortunate. I was part of a project that was well funded, but we were always encouraged oh. to chase more funding, chase more. And I, it's, sometimes it felt like, well, you know, you're encouraged to hoard funding for no reason when it could could even go to right. Now it's like, right. what's it, what's it for? Um, and right. I, and I, yeah, and I suppose that if you're in academia, it's that competitive edge, and it's and it's like that it was a massive turn off for me as well. I mean, yeah, yeah. And on top of that, it also, it, it skews the data because everybody's altering their, their projects because they, they're trying to tick the boxes to get the funding. So immediately, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, I just, I just found this irony of like, hang on, this is not, you know, unbiased research based on just the science. This is all yeah. skewed towards getting money from whoever you need it from. So yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a tough world and and i have friends that stayed with it and i'm very proud of them and the the science they do is incredible you know the people that have managed to stay in there and make things happen it's it's awesome but you know this last few years with the you know i don't want to get too far into politics because like, everyone's <laughs> sick of talking about that but i but i do feel like you know with depending on the current political climate it changes the the access to science and the, the the free thinking kind of you know you know world that, that we we need right now more than ever it gets limited you know by these these government uh, mentalities and and you you've seen it like you know this latest U.S. situation nothing it's never been more apparent you know watching science <laughs> yeah fold in on itself and and yeah let's just hope that that can turn around now in twenty one yeah I mean that's uh, it's been a bit of a a topic that's come up before it's with with you know the way science is going at the moment um especially um well i i was told recently about nature the publishing group how next year they're going to start charging ten thousand euros for people to to make their papers open access oh, wow. uh, you know so you know, talking of fund funding, when you when you when you need right. to put aside ten thousand dollars just to publish one paper to to maintain copyright and make sure everyone can see it, it's just a bit yeah. of a a strange um, a strange way forward in this this current climate, like you said, where we we really need people to 
have access to all the sites right. available. And, and it, it, it defeats the purpose. <laughs>